I completed honor mode on my first try and it took me about 50 hours to get to the end, but I will admit now that I skipped over large parts of Act 3 to get to the end and get my lovely golden dice. So why did I not go and kill every boss during the first run in Act 3? Well, it's because I'm neither stupid or brave. I wasn't going to risk my whole run on this first try. I took the beaten path to make sure I could get to the end on the first go. I'm not going to hold back on any spoilers, but I imagine if you're here watching this and you're either thinking of playing or have already played on a mode, and that will mean most of you have already played through the game at least once. I'll go over my general thoughts of honor mode, the builds of my characters, and lastly, I will give you some tips on how you can get through honor mode as well. Overall, honor mode was much more enjoyable than tactician, but also nerve wracking, especially on the first try and especially at the beginning, and I had to be much, much more careful. The new legendary actions definitely made the bosses more difficult, but also at the same time much more interesting, and the AI would target downed characters at times to try and kill them before moving on to the next party member. This ruthlessness increased the tension and the stakes, but in the end I only had a few characters actually die. Notably, I decided to fight the Githyanki patrol, and I think it was at level 5, and South Baratha decided she was taking no prisoners, and not only downed, but killed Gale and Shadowheart in a single turn with the use of Action Surge and a flurry of critical hits, and I'll get onto those a bit more later. After that incident though, it only had a few more deaths, Gale at one of the traps on the way to the Blood of Lathander, which launched him into the Abyss, Astarian going all Leroy Jenkins, fighting Yurgir in the Gauntlet of Shah, and Shadowheart got pushed into the sewer water and the Boulder's Gate, which I'm sure would kill any of us even those of us that can swim. What I'm trying to say really is that the times I had characters die were mostly times where I'd either let my guard down or had maybe become a bit blasé about my safety. Astarian didn't even die to Yurga in fact, but it was just from the sheer volume of attacks coming from the Merrigons. It was an enjoyable experience and I've already started my second playthrough and I would really encourage those of you who've definitely completed Tactician to at least give it a go and just to see what all the fuss is about and to see how far you can get. So next up is the builds of my characters. And before I go over them, I will say your builds don't need to be like bleeding edge min maxing, but at the same time, you probably shouldn't create a warlock, for example, with a low charisma that uses Eldritch Blast and Agonizing Blast. I did usually gravitate towards the feats and spells that I've ranked relatively highly in past videos, because I see no reason, saw no reason, to make things unnecessarily more difficult for myself. One feat that stood out to me was actually the alert feat, and I took it on three of my characters in the end, and it really helped me beat down one or two enemies before they got a turn in just about every combat, and in fact, in the fight against Merkel, I managed to kill him before he even got a turn, with the help of a few critical hits. Now since I've already completed the game, I cannot go and load older saves to show you the builds, there is one final save in the epilogue, which so I can show you my tav, but I can't show you my other characters. But I do have some screenshots and a bit of video from just after my fight against Orin, which I did do immediately before going to the Morphic Pool. So it's a pretty accurate representation of what I had towards the end of Act 3 at least. So Tav, my Tav, Honor Tav was her name, was a Paladin Sorcerer multi-class, a Sorkadin, with seven levels in Oath of the Ancients, although twice she did become an Oathbreaker, but I decided to come out of that, and then five levels in Storm Sorcerer. I went with level seven in Oath of the Ancients, because the extra healing she could provide was very was useful at times, and especially the aura at level seven provides resistance against damage from magical sources, like against spells, to really help the party stay alive. Her main role was to hit hard and smite on a critical hit, or when the likelihood of killing an enemy was high. And being a Paladin Sorcerer Multiclass, she was also the face of the party, because she had a decent enough charisma, her charisma was 16, and she also took the half illithid powers. Uh, she was eating tadpoles like the, there was no tomorrow, and she also passed all of the checks in the Zathisk in the Githyanki Crush, so she was able to use these illithid powers on a bonus action, and she took Cole the Week, so she, there was always a use for her bonus action. She was hitting hard, handing out smites, Oh, and lastly, she did take the Strength Potion from Araj Oblodra in Moonrise Towers, so her strength was 20, and she was an absolute powerhouse. The next big damage dealer was the classic Tavern Brawler, Open Hand Monk 8 D4 Multiclass, chugging potions of strength every day. This was a Starion. He was wearing the Graceful Cloth, so he had advantage on all dexterity checks, and as such became the de facto lock opener with expertise and sleight of hand. He also has the Bite, which gives him a plus one to attack and all of his skill checks, and he just hit often, hit hard, and if I had to guess, I wish I kind of wish there was a way the game tracked this for you. I'm sure he did more damage than anyone else. Although he didn't always get the highest damage numbers compared to smites on critical hits, every turn he was doing 20 to 30 damage with every single hit. And when he used the wholeness of body ability, which gives him an extra bonus action, and maybe he's been hasted one way or another, 
which gave him two actions, although in honor mode the second action can only be used for one extra attack, it's not a full round of attacks. But there were points where he could output like nine attacks in a single round, and some of these, most of them can either be stunning, pushing, staggering, knocking enemies prone. And in my fight against Orin, once she didn't have the unstoppable condition, she just melted away. Uh, there was no way she was going to survive. I also took Gale, who was a Divination Wizard 6, Law Bard 6, so he only got two beats or ability score improvements, and for that I took his intelligence to 18, and then for the feat I took Resilient Constitution to help him maintain concentration, but it also increased his hit points and constitution saving throws. Now the fact he didn't have intelligence at 20 really wasn't that much of a problem, especially towards the end. There's so much gear in Act 3 that increases the spell save DC. For example, he had Marker Heshkir, Hood of the Weave, Robe of the Weave, and the Amulet of the Devout. The spell save DC for his wizard spells was 22, and for his bard spells was 19. For the very final fight, he also took an elixir of Battle Mage's power, which then increased both of those spell save DCs by 3. And not only were his spell save DCs very high, which is very good for controlling or even just making any spell work, he was a divination wizard, so he had portent dice, and also as a lore bard, he had cutting words. And so anytime an enemy was making a saving throw, most of the time I could make them fail. And lastly, there was Shadowheart, a straight up level 12 life cleric. No multi-classing this time. And I chose a life cleric because, as I said, I'm not stupid, but I'm also not brave. So I chose a life cleric just in the event that I needed to press the oh crap button and I needed to start reviving or healing everyone. She had the necklace from Dareth Bonecloak, which gives her healing word and mass healing word. But she was also really good at giving out radiating orbs frequently because she was wearing the luminous armor and also gave her the Gloves of Belligerent Skies, which meant she could hand out Reverberation. So although she never really did the highest damage, she was so invaluable because she was handing out debuffs while buffing allies with Bless, either as a spell or through the Whispering Promise Ring. Just a great support character there. For the party as a whole, I felt like I wasn't really missing anything in particular. Now, I didn't have any ranged attackers in terms of bows or anything, but my Tav and Astarin could easily run down or teleport to ranged enemies if needed, as well as having the magical support from Gale and Shadowheart, who could either deal out damage or more frequently cast control spells. Two examples I'm going to give. First of all, the Roican. This was done on livestream. He didn't get to do anything in his fight because hold person and that was it. He never got a turn. And secondly, against Saravok. First of all, Gale locked three knights outside the room with arcane lock. Thank you to the commenters on my level two spell tier list video for giving me that tip. And then during the fight, Shadowheart banished the three bull spawn minions using her level six spell slot. And that meant from that point onwards, Saravok was living on borrow time as the party just pummeled him back into the abyss. So for the last section, I'm just going to give some tips. And if you have any tips that are useful, please feel free to share them with us in the comments section because I'm not going to cover absolutely everything. Now, first of all, the regular battles didn't really feel any more difficult compared to normal, but there was always the ever-present knowledge that should I fail, then that run is over. I've seen comments online saying that you should leave a single person in camp and then go and use the remaining three. So should anything go pear-shaped, then you would have someone in camp to revive everyone else. And that will work for most of the game. I would say you're kind of gimping yourself a little bit because it means you only have three people in the fights instead of four, which then reduces your damage output and spreads the incoming damage over fewer people. And kind of, for most people, will probably increase the likelihood that they will actually need that person in camp. Also, there are some battles where you can't even do that anyway, and they're probably the most difficult battles. So I, th I just think it's a bit unnecessary. But if it's your way through the game, it's fine. But don't ever feel ashamed of getting through the game however you can. Now, while I didn't have that safety net, the safety net I did give to myself was to make sure as many people had access to Misty Step as possible from either their class, items, or scrolls. And also, at least four invisibility potions at all times. So if anything did go really, really wrong, I was actually going to be able to flee in most fights. Obviously, some fights you can't run away from, but they're few and far between, really. What I did do, but will do a lot less in the future, in terms of having the safety net is camp casting. I've released a video on that already. I was casting most of the spells from that video, but the most important spell to me was probably Death Ward. That's really, really the best safety net. It makes you survive usually one extra attack, but that can make a difference when there are several attacks incoming, because if your character is downed, they can only take two attacks before they're dead, from melee, anyway. What Death Ward doesn't save against is being thrown or pushed into water or abyss or anything like that. I would also heartily recommend casting Aid at the highest possible level and Hero's Feast once you get it. And like I said earlier, I'm not, I'm not brave, so I was worried and scared of what was coming, and I wanted to make sure I was prepared as possible. Now talking of being prepared, you should think about how you're going to get through each part of the game and make plans accordingly. For example, even before the run started, I knew I wanted to 
to try and talk my way through the Act 2 Thorn bosses, which is one of the reasons I chose a charisma based class. And I also had access to guidance, not only proficiency in like persuasion, but also gave myself expertise. I had enhanced ability or friends. I got the necklace from Sovereign Spore, which helps an ally have a plus two to persuasion. A bardic inspiration, regular old inspiration, and needless to say, I was prepared. And in the end, it all worked out. I did not fight any of the Thorn family apart from Ketherick right at the end. And I even managed to persuade Ketherick to off himself in the last fight, so I only had to fight the Avatar of Merkel in the end. And talking about that fight with Merkel, this is probably an appropriate time to talk about critical hits, because my Paladin Sorcerer Multiclass, my Sorkadin, did manage to score two critical hits in a row and did a whole load of damage in one go. I think on her turn, she did about 100, over 100 damage by herself. And that's all great, but what you really need to be on the lookout for is actually being on the receiving end of critical hits, because especially in the early game, they can be absolutely brutal. And so I made myself the adamantine splint armor and the shield after defeating Grim, and Grim also himself drops the helmet. And all three of these items negate critical hits. And after I got them, I didn't take them off. Three of my four characters could not have critical hits against them. So Gale was wearing the shield from what I remember, my paladin was wearing the heavy armor, and I think Shadowheart, as she was a life cleric, was wearing the helmet, because that's also heavy armor. So I never had to deal with having a huge amount of damage coming my way all in one go. I'm not saying you have to take all three items, of course, but I would suggest it's a quite a good idea to have one or two of them at least, because critical hits can end the run very, very quickly. It did mean that I was never surprised with massive amounts of damage in one go. And speaking of surprise, there is no shame in preparing yourself to surprise the enemies as much as possible. After all, even within the game, the description for Honor Mode says it's only suitable for people who've already played. And you're not obligated to play this as though it's your first time through the game. You should use everything at your disposal to survive. Don't feel the need to put extra pressure on yourself when you read or see people playing through the game solo, like with one character or just one long rest per act or whatever other restriction people are self-imposing. They are just that, self-imposed. Now you will still end up having to fight some bosses and generally I got through them by focusing on the boss first. Fight against the Githyanki Inquisitor in the Kresh is a prime example of this, and I've read several people online have died at this fight, but he will summon some extras like spiritual weapon. Every turn he can get like two of them out, I think. That boss is a prime example of kill the boss first, because everything else goes away. A second example, I've already used this fight as an, as an example in this video, but it's Merkel. If you kill Merkel, the avatar of Merkel, that's it, you don't have to worry about anyone else. So I did not attack any of the skeletons that were there, I didn't attack the Mind Flayer, the Intellect Devourers, just went after Merkel alone. This idea doesn't only apply to bosses. In Baldur's Gate 3, enemies still deal their full amount of damage no matter whether they're at full health or barely surviving on one or two hit points. So outside of the boss fights, and this is just general tips for the game, not even just for honor mode, so you should generally focus either on the most dangerous enemies, often being spellcasters to be honest, although paladins can also cause massive problems because they unload their smites like they've got nothing to live for. Anders can end early runs as well. So anyway, apart from just taking out the most dangerous enemies, I would then also go after the enemies which are going to go next, because the best form of crowd control is giving enemies the dead condition, because they don't have any way of coming back from that. By the end of the game, I still had loads of consumables just in case. However, there were a few clutch items for the final boss that I would recommend to keep as well. Just before the final fight, I had five potions of angelic reprieve, which meant everyone could get a long rest. Everyone went in fully rested. And this works out so nicely because you don't lose any long rest buffs you had from before drinking the potion. So I cast all those buffs with any spell slots I had left over, then used the potions. Secondly, Elixirs of Vigilance are useful for anyone without the alert feat, and once initiative is determined, you can feed them another elixir, which is what I did with Gale in the final battle. So before I went up, I fed him an elixir of vigilance. He went at the first section of the turn order. And as soon as it was his first turn, I chugged an elixir of battle mage's power, which increases spell save DC. Thirdly, this is more for act three than anywhere else. Pick up any and buy any scrolls of globe of invulnerability as you can. Three of them can be found in Ramazith's tower alone. I bought one and I learned the spell also. And so when I went up in the final fight, I just huddled everyone together inside the globe, blasted away. There's no time limit in the final fight until you step through the portal and you're fighting the netherbrain. Yes, there is a timer at the side, like ooh, four turns left or whatever it is, but that's just until a nautiloid arrives and that there's some bombardment, there might be an extra mind flare, it's nothing. Basically, you don't need to worry about that. Also, for the last fight, haste spore grenades are absolutely amazing because every turn you can run in the haste spore grenade 
get an extra action, do something, and then you can use it again next turn without the downsides of losing haste. So I threw one at the beginning of the fight and also just before going through the final portal. So everyone could go in the final portal having two actions. And for the very, very last part of the game, I had, I can't remember how many now, five, six scrolls of Disintegrate. And so my characters were just casting that on the final boss. In my tier list video, I didn't rate Disintegrate very highly and I still don't as a known spell. But having it on scrolls for the final fight is really, really good because the brain's dexterity saving throw is really quite low and your spell casters especially should have very high spell save DCs by the end of the game. So in general, I would advocate that if you think you need to use a consumable, then just damn well use it. That's what they're for. And in honor mode, you don't get a second chance to decide that actually, after reloading, I will use that potion of speed or that scroll of hold person. The price of the more popular items have increased, some of them significantly. My impression is that Larian has gone through maybe the data from the playthroughs of all the players, found the most popular items, and then in some cases, increased the price dramatically. For example, the corrosive ring, available from Dereth Bonecloak in the Myconid colony, which adds two acid damage to any weapon attacks, is a ring I would normally have bought on Tactician without a second thought. It's a no-brainer because the value of the ring is like 40 gold and depending on who's speaking to Dereth, maybe pay something like 150, 200 gold. I don't remember the exact amount. But now in honor mode, the item's base value is shot up to 590 gold. And with just a plus five in persuasion and just a normal attitude, it's something in the region of like 2,200, 2,300 gold. Again, I don't remember the exact price. So something I didn't do in my first honor mode run, but I've now started to do in my second, is give items or money to, well, any trader, but to Dereth. And I've taken expertise and persuasion early on. Now with a plus eight in persuasion and having her at the maximum attitude, the ring now costs, well, I say only, but costs 1,003 gold. Even at that price, I haven't quite bought it yet. I'm waiting till I'm level five. And so my persuasion skill goes up even higher before buying it. And this is something you really just have to think about in honor mode. So you can have about the same amount of gold to work with, but the prices of items, not all of them, but some of the important items really has gone up. And so now I'm taking extra care to pick up almost anything and everything. So all of those rotten tomatoes, rotten carrots, freights themselves, I'm picking up and either selling or giving to traders to increase their attitude towards me. You could of course steal things, but I would only recommend doing that if you've got a halfling with either the graceful cloth, the gloves of thievery or enhanced ability to give yourself advantage on the sleight of hand checks, all the while having expertise and guidance and any other bonuses while stealing while hidden in fog cloud or darkness. Now each of us has our own level of risk aversion, but I imagine it would probably be best not to get into trouble in an area where there are a lot of NPCs just to get a few extra items. Overall, I feel the best advice is just to slow down, make sure you read all of your abilities, those of the enemy, and make decisions that either take out an enemy, control them in some way, or make it so they can't hurt you, such as just running out of range if, if possible. One last spell to mention regarding making sure enemies can't hurt you is counter spell, because it can stop so many enemies from not only casting spells, but it also stops them from using abilities sometimes that could seriously harm you. I never had any problems with long resting and the number of camp supplies. I was opening lots of rates and things to make sure I had camp supplies. If you really want to, you can use the camp casting with the druid at the end of the day just to create enough good berries to mostly make up for any missing camp supplies, but I've, I've never had any problems with it. Let me know what your tips are for honor mode. I've tried to avoid giving tips for most like individual fights because there are just so many to cover, too many to cover. It's not really the purpose of these tips. I wanted to give a more general tips that can apply throughout the run. I do hope you've found something either useful or interesting to use in your own games. Thank you very much for watching to all the members of my channel and hopefully I'll catch you in the next one.